for the last talk of the um, matinee, we have uh, a local one, Kevin Charles, who, Kevin Charles, who will uh, do a talk about on the prospects of the metaphysics of science and practice, and you have the floor. 30 minutes. Sure. But thank you everyone for being there. Uh, as you can see, the title is very, um, I'll say that, uh, exploratory. Uh, and the abstract was exploratory as well, and due to life that yeah, didn't have much time to work on it. So the more I read it goes, and the more speculative it will be, <laughs> the more open to the floor it will be. <laughs> So let's start first with a few pre preliminaries on uh, the states of metaphysics of science today and philosophy of science. So here is something that I stole from Alexandre, uh, <laughs> which is a nice way to present uh, the way you could do metaphysics. Uh, given that it's not everything that is done today, there are some parts that are not explored here. And that's the beauty of it is that you have different criteria of uh, physics uh, according to which type of um, authority you uh, you you uh, answer to? Uh, science, common sense, or traditional metaphysics is more like logics or you know, things of this sort. Um, you have another axe of potential um, of uh, projects, which is a priori, a priori methods or a posteriori method, and the last act being um, descriptive or revisionary. Uh, so either you are in the process of um, just exploring and clarifying clarify, clarify, clarify your uh, way to understand the world or you're trying to uh, go beyond the utterances to find new way to think about the world. So these are the three axes that Alexander proposed to, to, to write to, to describe the, the variety of possible metaphysical projects and uh, I think it's a good way to see it. So let's start by um, Justifying why you would do metaphysics science, maybe I mean you would. Uh, I guess you you're, you're all aware of it, but uh, it's, it's a, I, I didn't know how it's so late in the, in the workshop. So. Um, I feel offended. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Me too. So, uh, so uh, arguably, uh, we could take metaphysics is an epistemic project. Whether we are realist and we aim at uh, the real world as it is, the noumena, or we are more Kantian and we cannot access it and we're just uh, looking at uh, the way we conceive of the world. And uh, as armchair metaphysics is a type of rationalist metaphysics, it's epistemically sterile, so we should connect to our most, most promising activity, epistemic activity, which is today actually at least science. And uh, why? Because it's supposed to be uh, empirically grounded. Actually, the, uh, um, if, if you look at, uh, again, Alexandre's paper, you make a good point that there are two broad family of um, metaphysical science, which uh, is based on the a priori and a posteriori um, axis. Uh, that's not in the paper, but that's a way of seeing it. Uh, so there, are, there is metaphysics applied to science, so metaphysicians look, looking at science to constrain and um, get information and get um, better um, theories, metaphysical theories, and then you have scientific metaphysics, which is done mostly by field of science, and which is more in the process of um, deriving metaphysics from science, rather than taking metaphysics and then looking at science. So um, just in a better, in a more, like with a few examples, so metaphysics applies to science, the purpose is to build, build the potential world systems. So uh, science is just secondary constraints, which is there to pro pro uh, provide a form of tethering to the actual <coughs> worlds. Metaphysics first, science later. Compatibility is sufficient, and that, that's the kind of idea you have in uh, Lewis and Morbibi's uh, effective equilibria uh, conception of metaphysics, or uh, as in, in uh, Law's uh, quote here. And the other that I will be uh, interested in, and that uh, I will stay in for, th for this talk, is just scientific metaphysics, and the purpose of it is to build a scientific image of the world or scientific images of the world. It's uh, there is no a priori reasons why there should be only one. Uh, uh, we're talking in the uh, norm normatively speaking. Uh, metaphysics, in this sense, is an extension of the way science and uh, present and understand the world. So uh, 
there is no a priori reasons to, to commit either to uh, there is no also, there is also no a priori reason to commit to scientific realism or uh, to restrict ourselves to uh, just theories. The idea is just science first, metaphysics later, and you could do a phenomenological approach to uh, scientific metaphysics like a uh, big ball or Berghofer or Wilshire are doing right now. It's kind of in style, or you could go back to Sellars' way of doing uh, scientific <coughs> images. The issue being that uh, if you look at the actual literature of scientific metaphysics, so um, metaphysics done by people who are mostly philosophers of science, actually these uh, points that have no actual <coughs> reasons to be uh, taken are taken for granted. So here are a few quotes to uh, show that I'm not speaking like, uh, out of. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I would say that. Uh, <laughs> So in, in Modlin, uh, you have uh, the idea of basically idea is simple. Metaphysics, insofar as it is <coughs> concerned with the natural world, can do no better than to reflect on physics. Physical theories provide us with the best handle we have on what there is. The philosopher's proper task is interpretation and elucidation of his theories. So it's not science, it's theories. And uh, same for Lediman and Ross. Um, uh, by, uh, by, the, by radically naturalistic metaphysics, we mean a metaphysics that is motivated exclusively by attempts to unify <coughs> hypotheses and theories that are taken seriously by contemporary science. So the ground of scientific metaphysics, at least today, is not science, it's scientific theories. And usually in this type of, uh, with this pair pick of people, it's mostly a fundamental physics, because everything has to reduce at the end to fundamental physics. Uh, it's just an, an over quote to, to show that uh, um, people are saying that. Uh, so these are the important points that I, I want to really uh, um, put into a, a highlight. is the fact that in contemporary metaphysics, uh, scientific metaphysics, the starting point is always theories of theoretical representation. And it, I don't know if it requires, I don't know if it's, uh, it starts from, uh, from uh, scientific realism commitment or it follows or then it goes to scientific realism. I don't know which is first. It's a chicken and egg question. But the idea is in the end that ontology and uh, epistemology are two separate fields, and you can build theory. Your theory are approximately true of the world, so you can just look at the theory, and then you will have a direct relation to what is metaphysics real in the world. And it goes obviously with a very strong revisionist attitude. So if you go back to the box, it's part of this little corner with which you, you have uh, revisionary a posteriori metaphysical science. So just on the left uh, front corner of the box. <coughs> uh, in this type of uh, theory, it's hard to see how uh, scientific knowledge <coughs> is not a type of metaphysical knowledge. Maybe there's difference of maybe degrees, but not of nature at least. Uh, here is the, the problem. So let, let, let me uh, be a bit opinionated here on the history of philosophy of science. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, Alexandre told me that I should put opinionated, opinionated there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, here are a few, uh, here are how I see it at least. So we had a huge uh, part of philosophy uh, of science that was mainly theory based. And uh, that's when uh, metaphysics came about so with the revival of realism in the 60s and 70s. I'm not exactly sure when. You have Putnam in 75, which is a numeric, numerical, uh, numeric, uh, numerical argument. So around these this years, you have realism coming back. And I guess metaphysics is back in style as well uh, with wine and all the way afterward. But the thing that most uh, that is mostly uh, forgotten in this kind of metaphysics is that, I mean, in the, in the, in the 80, in 83, we had two, big, two books that are quite important, at least for field of science, which are, the, which are uh, representing and intervening from hacking and uh, how the laws of physics lie from Cartwright, which uh, started the new experimentalism and the turn to practice. And that's something that uh, you see, uh, there's a lot, a lot of debates. And at, at some point, if you look at the literature, uh, I mean, if someone is, uh, computer scientists, I want to do the corpus uh, analysis with <laughs> which I made is um, they are free to go, but uh, I'm not good enough at that. But if you, if you I mean, from, a, in, from an instinctive point of view, when I look at the two uh, type of uh, literature, uh, of philosophy of science and practice and more orthodox philosophy, there seems to be like a, a real divide after the science wars, where people don't talk to each other and you have 
two different communities with two different uh, uh, paradigm, uh, actually, the paradigm of what science is and how you should the philosophy of science. And that is not as reflected, at least and to my knowledge, not reflected at all in the metaphysics of science and in the this scientific metaphysics that I was talking about. So let, let's do a few uh, very caricatural way to characterize both project in philosophy of science uh, to see uh, how, metaphysically speaking, it should be uh, different as well. So, I mean, I, as, you, as you all know, uh, New, new experimentalism starts start from uh, Hacking's uh, motto that experimentation has a life of, of its own. And uh, it uh, implies a lot of things for future of science in practice afterwards. So you should mainly look at practice. So you should actually see uh, science as an activity and uh, have an active view of knowledge. <coughs> so science is done by agents that do something with the world. It's not just a spectator passive new passive stuff that you just look at yourself passively the world and then you get knowledge of it. Uh, agents have a, a real um, um, impact on uh, the knowledge you get from the world. <coughs> you you uh, tend to have in science and practice acceptance of socio-historical critics of scientific objectivity, of feminist critics and uh, of critics of uh, <coughs> the possibility to have progress in a very uh, strong, strong objective way, which goes with uh, critics of representationalism and the possibility to have non-epistemically non true representation of the world. And it goes also with a uh, tendency to reject standard scientific realism, to go more into a uh, pragmatist or Kantian flavor stuff. So do we reconnect this uh, ontology and epistemology uh, um, link that you don't have in the orthodox field of science, as I call it? So let me uh, now put the, the claim that I wanted. Uh, I would like to um, <coughs> to defend in this talk. So I want. I want I'd like to move, to motivate uh, a move away from theory based scientific metaphysics to a more comprehensive uh, scientific metaphysics. If I can, at the same time, convince you that there are ways to metaphysics starting from scientific practices and experimental form of knowledge. Great. Uh, and uh, at least I can argue that uh, this kind of scientific practice and experimental form of knowledge metaphysics, if they manage to uh, take off, they would stand on firmer ground, empirical ground than the theoretical based uh, scientific, of scientific metaphysics. So let me start at something that is absolutely not original, uh, but I, sorry, stole from, from you. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I really like this idea to have a metric to uh, evaluate the empirical grounding of our uh, metaphysical <coughs> project. So the, the, this is symmetric at least of a former version. I don't know if it, has, if it has changed that much. Um, it has two, par two parameters, experiential distance and epistemic risk. <coughs> so exper experiential distance being um, how much your object of inquiry is far away from uh, the empirical ground. And epistemic risk being how much is your uh, hypothesis or claim susceptible to, to be uh, disconfirmed by uh, empirical work. And that's the metric I will use uh, to uh, evaluate and uh, show that metaphysics <coughs> of scientific in practice should, according to this metric, be a more uh, promising way to do uh, metaphysical scientific metaphysics. <coughs> so for theoretical based scientific metaphysics is actually a very ambitious project. Uh, <coughs> It doesn't uh, just stop at compatibility. It wants to go really like an uh, entailment of metaphysics from science. But as I said, and from, I mean, if you look at Ledman and Ross, <coughs> uh, and in their, in their uh, Everything Must Go book, and their defense of scientism, they say that they are being uh, entailed by empirical science, but actually they are being entailed by theoretical uh, theories. And all they talk about and all they care about most of the time is theories. And that's, uh, that's required, uh, requires uh, a part of uh, scientific realism that is kind of controversial, which is the epistemic physics that we, uh, our theories now are approximately true of the world. We, you can say something, you can infer something <coughs> true of the world from our scientific theory now, now uh, which, I mean, uh, Lediman puts, puts uh, the claim that realism and uh, is form of metaphysics goes together. And if a project of scientific realism goes away, is metaphysics go away as well. 
Mm. <clears throat> and this type of uh, metaphysics is actually um, very, uh, if you look at the, at, uh, the constructive and feminist critics that you have in physics of science in practice, this type of metaphysics is, very, is quite in danger. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not uh, aware enough of all the critics to make around them, and I don't think I have time to, to do anything like that. So uh, let me start by uh, something that uh, I like uh, quite a lot, and which is less uh, explored away and more in the detail, more in the content. So there are ways actually to um, to find uh, metaphysical content from scientific practices as entities. Uh, uh, remember the uh, best friend of the, 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 the realist, the scientific realist, or the philosopher of uh, science, the inference of the best explanation, the, um, the inference from the premises that the given premises would provide a better explanation for the evidence that could any other thesis to the conclusion that the given hypothesis is true. And the question being that, uh, in, in since naturalistic, naturalistic metaphysics is a project to emphasize continuity with content or method of empirical science, yeah, you could argue that inference to the explanation is also uh, a good method to use in metaphysics. It's a very polemical point. Uh, mm -hmm. But let, let's assume that uh, you can use uh, IBEs in, <coughs> in naturalized metaphysics. We know that uh, certain <coughs> practices are successful because science is successful. And we know that they are sufficiently stable in time and actually most of the time more, sc more stable than uh, scientific results. And uh, we know that are, these practices are successful in virtue of empirically accessible features, so they are a posteriori entity in a sense. So there is no reason why we could not uh, do the same stuff that scientific metaphysics do with theories, starting from scientific practices as entities. And that's something that actually has been done by uh, someone in the Inductive Metaphysics Project, so <laughs> uh, Andreas Hittmann. Uh, and he, he uh, use uh, inference-based explanation starting from uh, prediction, manipulation, and this type of m experimental uh, practices to infer uh, metaphysical um, claims on uh, how the model structure of flows is how the model uh, features of flow works, and how the structure of causality works, and all this kind of stuff. So here is an example. So uh, starting from the <coughs> external internal generalization in scientific practice, infer model assumption and uh, the best account of um, infer uh, how the model surface structure law works. And since uh, this, these scientific practices are, as I said, technically successful in virtue of empirically accessible factors, they are a posteriori. But since it's, it's, these are still uh, scientific uh, practices, they are, it's a descriptive project. So actually, if you go back to the box, it's a different, uh, it's a new, non-explored so far uh, part of the box, at least from what, from how in the, I understand it. So uh, this, this is the, the point that I uh, have uh, no satisfying answer, answer that, uh, which uh, on, on which the whole project uh, relies. So if you have good answer, I, I welcome, <laughs> I welcome them. Uh, actually, IBEs are quite. Uh, uh, controversial. So the issue is that uh, what, what, what does it mean to be the best explanation or the better explanation? Uh, do we have uh, standard, uh, enough precision on this type of uh, values to rank, rank uh, projects and um, hypothesis in a, in a serious and precise manner? Are there just uh, pragmatic virtues, uh, in which case uh, you couldn't infer the truth from this kind of virtues. And uh, if you have multiple set of virtues, do they all select the same hypothesis at the end? That's one of the objections. The other objection is coming from Van Frasen, and uh, same, I, I don't have a satisfying answer to this one either, is that uh, you're forced to take the hypothesis that you have actually so far, and you don't know which one will come afterwards. So maybe the one you have are just really bad and we'll have the best one afterwards. And so that, that you, can, you can't know. Another, another argument that you have though that uh, I know how to, to, to answer to is uh, one coming from Ladyman who uh, says that you shouldn't use IBEs in metaphysics. You can use them in science because in science you have, uh, you can do an induction from past success of this kind of uh, um, process, processes 
and uh, this legitimates the, the IBS in science but you cannot do the same thing in metaphysics so you shouldn't use it in metaphysics you should just use it in science but uh, the pessimistic meta-addiction seems to me uh, to, to give yeah, as, as many anecdotes of case of it not working uh, in science either so to me the, the legitimacy of IBS should not be different in science and metaphysics it's it should be the same, and even more if uh, in the project of scientific metaphysics, scientific knowledge is uh, just a type of metaphysical knowledge. So, um, as a review, uh, so provided you, ac you accept the legitimacy of ideas, <coughs> scientific practices carry with them a kind of uh, metaphysical content that you can extract, and that you can use in, in proper uh, metaphysical projects. Uh, and if you uh, look back to the metric that we had before, um, since uh, scientific practices are actual acts in the world, actual empirical acts in the world, not representation of uh, stuff in the world, you are closer to the, to the empirical one that you will be with the theories. So you are the better, you, you, are, you, you fare better in the exponential distance variable, and <coughs> the epistemic risk. <coughs> I would argue that for the epistemic risk, it's the same. Because the selection of scientific practices is stricter than theories. You, due to the under, under, under determination of theories, you can have a lot of uh, theories that uh, survive, uh, while scientific practices, if they don't work, scientists will abandon them quite quickly. <coughs> so, uh, on both of these uh, cases, it fares, it fares better than uh, the traditional theory based scientific <coughs> of, metaphysic of science. But now, uh, if you're not. Uh, very uh, comfortable with IBEs. There is another way to uh, see uh, metaphysical content inside uh, <coughs> inside scientific practices and experimental practices, and uh, that's something that you find in uh, actually a field of physics uh, example. So uh, here are a couple of examples of uh, concerns you can find if you look at uh, contemporary field of physics. So uh, in uh, the wave function realism. You have uh, the concern that uh, the wave function realist uh, cannot construe ordinary space and space time as fundamental uh, as, uh, as fundamental. So um, they cannot uh, support the idea that you have local behaviors and local behaviors that are taken to be necessary for experimental practice. So there is a threat that your interpretation of the theory is uh, empirically incoherent. That means that uh, if it were true the scientific practices uh, wouldn't take off, and so you couldn't justify your, uh, the truth of your theory. And this kind of worries, uh, uh, they appear a lot in uh, the quantum gravity ca case, and that, that's where I found them at the start. Uh, so you have that in a get get in the Trish article from 2013, but um, uh, in quantum gravity, you don't have space time. <coughs> if you don't have space time, and uh, our experimental work is arguably something that you do in space and time, or in space time. It's hard to see how uh, you could uh, argue for the fact that there is no space time by doing experiments in space time. So there seems to be a, a balance between metaphysical interpretation of theory and metaphysical interpretation of what is needed to do your, uh, your practice to justify your theory. So it, it has a, 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 concern, a kind of constant flavor. So here, here is a definition of uh, the empirical incoherence uh, concept. So a metaphysical interpretation for a given theory is empirically incoherent whenever holding it to be true pre precludes the metaphysical conditions for carrying out the scientific practices that went into providing empirical legitimacy to the theory. So in these cases, scientific practices seems to carry transcendental constraints on our liberty to uh, metaphysically interpret the theories. So uh, there is a kind of transcendental argument somewhere behind it that you could decipher and uh, that you should maybe recognize uh, and put to the front. Okay. <laughs> uh, and theory based on the scientific metaphysics, who doesn't look at the epistemology and just at the theory, is always at risk of uh, going too far in this in tendency and going into this empirical incoherence. 
Okay, so um, these are so this is a, a way to see to, to see it. Uh, it, it was proposed by uh, Azok Cheng uh, to uh, have this kind of uh, to, to, uh, to formalize kind of uh, argument as contingent on some arguments. Uh, he sums it up as so: uh, if you want to engage in some in certain type of, acti of activity, you have to presume the truth of some particular metaphysical principle that uh, legitimate this activity metaphysically wise. So for some example, uh, if you uh, want to uh, engage in voluntary action, you should presuppose that you have some agency. If not, uh, voluntary actions make no sense. If you want to uh, uh, engage in intervention, you should pr propose a form of causality. Of you should presuppose that your actions can make something happen. So there is a kind of um, way to, to get transcendental arguments out of uh, scientific practices. Uh, however, these arguments are contingent because we are talking about uh, practices and engagement on, on the activities that are contingent themselves. Uh, they are not, uh, we are not concerned in this uh, sense. We are not trying to find the universal condition of, uh, of uh, knowledge. We are just looking at uh, what you need to engage in certain activity metaphysically wise. And uh, even then, it seems to be a, a type of IBEs because this type of activity that you want to engage in are technically uh, are supposed to be successful because uh, you don't want to uh, say that if you engage in astrology, you have to accept metaphysically that the movement of star impact your our destiny, and you don't want to uh, to have that as a metaphysical commitment. <coughs> uh, okay, so that's a very exploratory part. Uh, experimental form of scientific knowledge and experimental based metaphysical science. So I, I don't have a lot of time, so it's, <laughs> it's good, but uh, I don't have time to go into very exploratory stuff. Uh, so is there a possibility for genuine experimental knowledge that is not uh, theory uh, based or theory oriented? Uh, m most of these uh, studies are historical studies, so I won't go through the, all the history. But if you look at the way uh, electromagnetism was done in the uh, 1820s in Faraday and Ampère, uh, Steinleuf uh, showed that you have two <coughs> types of experiments. You have a theory driven experiment, the one that we are used to, that uh, are there to, um, to test or uh, to uh, legitimize uh, a theory. But you also have another type of experiment that is very interesting. These are experiments that have no uh, no purpose, uh, no uh, theory oriented purpose. The purpose is to uh, test stuff in, uh, in, the, in the laboratory and see what's come out, what comes out without uh, constraining yourself to a uh, goal oriented uh, theory, uh, to, to a goal that, is, that would be a, a kind of theory or kind of hypothesis <coughs> you want to test. And uh, so, so you have, it, it's not like a just uh, do whatever you want and see what, what comes out. There, are, there is actually a methodology in this kind of exploratory experiment that supports the idea that you can have actually genuine experimental knowledge of uh, low-level regulatory relations. So there are a way to get uh, experimental knowledge. Now, the interesting part is that according to the literature on, exp on exploratory experiment, if you look historically speaking at uh, how uh, they uh, at when they, uh, they develop and uh, what is uh, surrounding them. This, this happens when you have no uh, theory uh, around, and, that, and that's, that's when you have actually drastic conceptual re revision uh, in science. So if uh, in metaphysics of science and scientific metaphysics, uh, you have to take into account scientific progress and to say something about scientific progress at some point, you should probably uh, put more uh, emphasis and look more at this kind of uh, events in science where conceptual shifts uh, are quite evident and are coming from purely empirical matter, uh, experimental matter and not uh, theory theoretical or conceptual uh, ideas. And this, this type of, uh, um, to my knowledge, this type of uh, literature doesn't exist. No, nobody has really uh, formally uh, worked on uh, how this exploratory experiment impacted the development of uh, subsequent uh, conceptual uh, shift. Another way of uh, meaning that I have is done. Or well, <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> so I will just, just skip that. And uh, there will be no yeah, discussion. I will just uh, say that there are a few other type of 
project that I could have uh, gone through, uh, expert algorithm, but since Quentin was talking about that, I, saw, I, don't, I don't want to just uh, rehearse the same thing. Uh, there is another way you can just accept uh, pragmatism from the scientific practice and go full pragmatic metaphysics. So to my knowledge, there are a few uh, stuff going around. You have the Putnam uh, from 2004 and the Bistrom from 2009. And the interesting part is that Actually, uh, it looks a lot like uh, the Levinasian uh, um, betrayal of Husserl in the sense that what is first in the ethics, ethics, you have to discuss norms and how norms impact uh, the practices before you, have, before you can discuss metaphysics. So your metaphysics is based on ethics, and ethics is first philosophy. Another way to do, to, to do this kind of science and practice metaphysics would be to uh, adapt a uh, Brandon type of inferentialism or expressivism where meaning and use are related, and you just could translate that to a future of science. To my knowledge, it hasn't been done so far. And you could also uh, go the full cellar's way in space of reason, and that has been done actually. So. The term is a consecrated term in the literature, so that's why I'm using it. Okay. But the, the idea is that uh, when you uh, I mean, when you do uh, an interpretation of a theory, and your uh, interpretation says that, uh, for example, uh, there is absolutely nothing that changes. Uh, it's, it's, it's the case. I mean, it's, it's the case for my physics. When you look at a uh, general relativity, there's a way to interpret it as saying that there is absolutely nothing physical that changes. And then you look at the way uh, generativity <coughs> is being legitimized by your uh, empirical practices, and you see that you need some kind of, of physical changes to a physical change to uh, say that, well, generativity is a legitimized uh, theory. So if your interpretation tells you that your uh, empirical practice can't uh, take off, can't, can't, get, uh, can't, 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 can't uh, be, can be carried out, then you are in, uh, in an issue because uh, there is uh, some kind of circularity and vicious circularity here. So this is really a problem of uh, what uh, metaphysically is necessary to do the experiment and what uh, you infer metaphysically from the theory and that uh, those two uh, metaphysical uh, interpretation clashing out. Yeah, that's, that's interesting because in some cases that can rule out metaphysical um, interpretation which seems yeah. to be uh, coherent with the theoretical content as we will be with Exactly. Uh, that's how it was introduced, actually. If you look at the original paper, the first paper talking about that, it was uh, in 1997 by Barrett. And uh, it was uh, an argument against some type of uh, interpretation of quantum physics that, uh, that, had, uh, that presupposed that there is no uh, record of past measures, and we need that to, uh, to do empirical uh, experiments. So that, that was a way to constrain the type of uh, interpretation you could get out of the theory. So you're right. So. And John? Uh, this is just a suggestion, actually. I think this is a really great project, and I think it's going to be very exciting. Um, I have a suggestion that might uh, maybe in some ways deepen it or complexify it a little bit, because I think the way that we frame these issues as philosophers and the way we might frame these issues as scientists may be you know, partially overlap but are, are different. So as philosophers, we have to make this distinction between you know, theory and practice. Like 
which tend to be theory and experimental practice or something like that. Right? Um, but you know, in the sciences, we think of theorizing as a form of practice, right? and experimentation as a form of practice, and there are other forms of practice. So my suggestion was really just to look at, I don't know if you've looked at Peter Callison uh, yeah. uh, and others, because he has, I think, things that might be interesting for you to say about how theoreticians and experimentalists, and he even includes a third group, instrument makers, actually think about the phenomena differently, and then end up characterizing it differently in different metaphysical terms. And that might be interesting to try to plug into your analysis. So no, it's just a suggestion. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's uh, just that the way I present it uh, usually is a kind of a, uh, the reaction to the, <laughs> the type of scientific metaphysics, which is well, well, because if you look at, uh, if you remember in Lediman and, uh, and Ross in their defense of scientism, they talk about uh, the practice of science and then everything else is about theory. <laughs> and the practice is theoretical practice. So. But you're right that, uh, in, and I think in science and practice, I mean, I'm not the most uh, knowledgeable about that, but I think it's in the field of science and practice, uh, you have people like Gooding uh, or uh, Rader or some of the guys who are like, effectively uh, they're talking about, uh, thinking about how the theoretical and the, uh, the, uh, the experimental practice are bootstrapping, bootstrapping one another and uh, effectively going on one another. Yeah, but you're absolutely right. Thank you very much for um, yeah, I also wanted to come back to the empirical incurrence. Uh, could you come back to this previous? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I just didn't get the space time uh, example. Because so when you say that uh, it's incurrent to say that space time, that we use space time uh, in our experiment, and say that space time is, uh, is just not a fundamental property. So the thing is, uh, in this paper, uh, they have uh, a very opinionated uh, understanding of how experiments work, uh, which comes from Modlin, and uh, which is the same type of, uh, of uh, problem that uh, Modlin raised for the wave function horizon. Uh, they, uh, they, they believe that to carry out experiments, you need be able, so you need entities that live in space and time, or in space time. And the fact that uh, in certain um, uh, interpretation of quantum gravity and some, some theory and some interpretation of quantum gravity, you have no space time at all at the fundamental level, is an issue because then how do you test uh, something that has, like, that can't, uh, how, how do you test something that is not in space time with uh, you being in space time? And but you, you, you could just say that space time is not fundamental but it's emergent, and that in our atom scale, we we use space time and it's... Uh, uh, that's that's, uh, that's, that's their, uh, what they are pointing to are, and that's uh, the topic of current uh, field of physics that you probably know. Yeah. But it's kind of uh, hard to know what it means to be the emergent and how this emergence can yeah. uh, carry out the legitimacy of like macro-level experiment. To uh, yeah, yeah, but I, I mean, my, my fundamental issue is more general than uh, this particular example. Mm -hmm. It's like... You, you can always say that the metaphysics, formal metaphysics, is some way, and the practice is uh, another way, and say that the second uh, way of the way the, how the way of the world is is uh, emerge or is derived from without having an incoherence. It's just different. It's just uh, uh, one depends upon another. It's not. Uh, no, you just, I mean, you're right that in, in these cases uh, we are talking with people who think that there is only one metaphysics. So. <laughs> Yeah, so there is, there is yeah, yeah, the no, uh, if, if you ground the metaphysics at the fundamental level, you can say there is one metaphysics, but at our level, it's just manifestly different. Uh, uh, I don't have a good answer to, 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 to tell you right now, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And I'd say it's a question that I actually uh, I thought at some point, but I, I don't have a good answer to that because I think it would depend on the type of emergence and rejection I mean, you would have to say more about what type of emergence and religion uh, is effectively uh, used. Yeah. But I, uh, I don't know enough about emergence to, 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 to answer you uh, precisely, sorry. I also, if I can, um, in, um, the argument seems to be kind of circular because, I mean, saying that practice uh, happens in space time presupposes that space time exists. Uh, mm. um, um, so you're just presupposing that space time exists because practice happens in space time, but one can say, well, I presuppose that practice happens, but it's not in space time. 
and in a sense, in a sense, it's, it's the same direction as it, it is going. It's emerging or you know non-existent cloud. It's just we are we are among I mean, we are in relation to other things, but space time is just the way we conceptualize those um, um, our our being world. Is the response or is the question? Uh, yeah, I have uh, a comment on that. I second. Yeah, no, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. But look at the others. Ah, sorry, sorry. They <laughs> need to be fed. <laughs> <laughs> so you can continue the discussion. <laughs>